Elijah McCoy is the most celebrated black man from Ypsilanti, but H.P. Jacobs' role historically is indeed far more important than Elijah McCoy's. While Elijah McCoy succeeded in prospering in a white world, H.P. Jacobs created a black world out of the aftermath of the Civil War. Here we are on the corner of Catherine and South Hamilton Street at the site of Second Baptist Church, founded by H.P. Jacobs and William Casey before the Civil War. It's one of the many institutions that survived both in Ypsilanti and in the country as a legacy to H.P. Jacobs. The many institutions founded by H.P. Jacobs that are still in existence include Jackson State University, one of the premier African-American colleges in the United States. The Mississippi State Baptist Convention is also in existence. H.P. Jacobs founded that and served as president for its first seven years after the Civil War. Also as part of his legacy is Second Baptist Church here in Ypsilanti, founded by Jacobs and William Casey, another person who escaped from bondage before the Civil War. Included in H.P. H.P. Jacobs' legacy here in Ypsilanti has to be the Perry School, which began as a segregated school for African Americans around the Civil War and was, got its impetus by H.P. Jacobs seeking to provide education for the children of local African American families who were not provided that in the local white schools. Here we are at Ypsilanti's historic South Adams Street School and it's a great place to talk about the education of H.P. Jacobs. Nothing was more important to H.P. Jacobs than education, both for himself his family, and for the community he came from. Wherever H.P. went, it seems he founded a school. H.P. Jacobs was the prime mover in founding education here in Ypsilanti, specifically for African American children. Before the Civil War, African American children could go to school here in Ypsilanti, but they were told to sit in the back. Rather than face humiliation every day for their children, local African American families withdrew their children from school and placed them in a school of their own with black teachers. In demanding a school for their own children, Ypsilanti African Americans weren't demanding segregation, but were demanding an end to the humiliation their children suffered in a predominantly white school. It was the ability to learn how to read and write that allowed H.P. Jacobs to forge his freedom papers and make a strike for liberty. He felt the same about all of his people. Education was a path to liberation. H.P. Jacobs was a lifelong learner. From learning how to read and write to facilitate his escape from bondage with his family to becoming a medical doctor at a college in Louisville at the age of 65, H.P. Jacobs never stopped learning and never stopped demanding education for his people. Here we are at the home of Anna Jacobs de Hazen and her husband, Robert de Hazen, a local barber. Anna Jacobs de Hazen was H.P. Jacobs' oldest daughter and a graduate of the Normal College Music School. She would have taught music right here in the front rooms of this house. H.P. Jacobs and his wife Louisa would have five children, three of whom were born in bondage in Alabama, Sam, Mary, and Anna. Two others would be born here in Ypsilanti, Elizabeth and Julia. As testimony to how close the family was, after the death of the mother Louisa, the eldest daughter, Anna, would raise the other children. Unusually for the time, the daughters of H.P. Jacobs continued to use their last name Jacobs after they were married, hyphenating their name with their husband's name. This is most certainly the home H.P. Jacobs would have visited on his return trips to Ypsilanti for various Emancipation Day celebrations or to visit with his family. This home was occupied by the Jacobs de Hazen family from about the mid-1880s until about 1910. The front room of this home was used by Anna Jacobs de Hazen to teach music to local African American girls. Taught at Eastern Michigan University's Music Conservatory, Anna Jacobs de Hazen was one of the foremost African American pianists in Ypsilanti of her time. Music is closely associated with the family of H.P. Jacobs. 
Three of his daughters became music teachers after graduating from the musical conservatory here in Ypsilanti. His eldest daughter, Anna Jacobs de Hazen, taught piano at her front room of 111 South Adams Street. There she trained her child, Allie de Hazen. Allie de Hazen, H.P. Jacobs' granddaughter, was said to be a musical genius trained by her own mother in piano. Allie would go on to marry a doctor and live in Washington, Pennsylvania, where she would continue teaching music until her old age. Here we are in downtown Ypsilanti at the corner of Washington Street and Michigan Avenue at The Mix, formerly Hewitt Hall, behind me. It used to have a third story taken down in the early 1930s. In that third story, innumerable events connected with Ypsilanti's African-American community were held, including several visits by Frederick Douglass and the adaptation of Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin well before the Civil War. It was in this building in 1863 that a historic meeting was held, hosted by H.P. Jacobs. Attended by many of the most important African-American leaders of the Great Lakes, including the father of black nationalism, Martin R. Delaney, the meeting held in January 1863 behind me was a statewide convention of African-American men. That convention met to demand that the state of Michigan remove the word white from all of its statues books and that blacks and whites be treated as equals. Movements among the colored citizens. The state convention of the colored men of Michigan held at Ypsilanti January 28, 1863, appointed a committee to appear before the legislature and urge the removal of the word white from the statute books, in furtherance of which object they submitted the following appeal of the State Central Committee of Colored Men. The State Central Committee, as the representatives of the general interests of the colored people of the state of Michigan, have thought it advisable to accompany these proceedings with an appeal to their white fellow citizens. Our object is plain and simple. Organic disabilities are always dangerous, and the longer they stand, the more serious they become. The Constitution of the State, Article 7, Section 1, recognizes alone the white and Indian residents as citizens. This is to us a disability the most grievous and unjust. At such a time as this, when our beloved country is writhing beneath the throes of civil war, every man, of whatever race or color, who at all values the endearing name of American citizen, should be called upon and required to do his duty in upholding the general government and putting down the most infamous rebellion that ever distracted a country in the history of the world. Whatever may be required of others should be required of us and we feel willing and stand ready to obey our country's call in a summons to arms in her defense or in any other just capacity in which we may be required. But, as residents of the state of Michigan, we cannot feel willing to serve a state while it concedes all that is due to others and denies much, if not the most, that is due to us. Therefore, in view of all these facts, we appeal to you, as fellow citizens of the same state and one common destiny, to use your influence by petition and otherwise to have the word white erased from the state constitution and to urge the repeal of all laws and statutes which make a distinction between us and other citizens of the state. W. J. Whipper, G. W. Ellis, J. S. Campbell, Mr. Martin, Mr. Brown, State Central Committee, Ypsilanti, January 30th, 1863. Ypsilanti's civil rights movement begins even before the Civil War. After the passage of the 15th Amendment, giving African American men the right to vote, a huge celebration was held here behind me at Hewitt Hall. H.P. Jacobs did not join the United States Colored Troops during the Civil War in part perhaps because he had a family, and in part perhaps because he was not going to take orders from white officers. While H.P. Jacobs did not participate as a soldier in the Civil War, he participated actively in the politics on the home front. H.P. Jacobs would also write a column to the local press describing politics in the South in the period of Reconstruction. Even after H.P. Jacobs left Ypsilanti, he would return routinely to participate in Ypsilanti's Emancipation Day events. Emancipation Day was celebrated every August 1st, and it was to celebrate emancipation in the British Empire, which meant freedom in Canada for African Americans. 
There was perhaps no more important day in the social, political, and cultural calendar for Ypsilanti African Americans than August 1st, Emancipation Day. Perhaps the most important person, historically, black or white, to ever call Ypsilanti home was H.P. Jacobs, and he began his life here in Ypsilanti at Eastern Michigan University, formerly Michigan Normal College, as the janitor. He enrolled his daughters into the music conservatory attached to the school. There, his daughters learned piano and several other instruments and would go on to become some of the leading musicians in the African-American community of their period. An 1859 fire here at the Michigan Normal College was blamed by the Detroit Free Press on the janitor, H.P. Jacobs, primarily because of his color. The story of H.P. Jacobs makes us ask how many other janitors as full of potential as H.P. Jacobs himself didn't become state senators, didn't found institutions like H.P. Jacobs, but lived their lives in drudgery. It's for those people that H.P. Jacobs dedicated his life. Thank you.